Okay, so we're going to crack on. We are carrying on in our two-part mini-series, which we've entitled um, Above All Else. And the basic premise, if you remember, of this is there's just so much going on in the world, so much news, um, and it can be hard to stay focused on the things that we as Christians uh, need to stay focused on. And I said from Scripture, we get um, in Proverbs 4.23, uh, Solomon says, uh, above all else, guard your heart, because out of it flow all of the issues of life. Everything you do flows from that. And so we were looking last week at why we have idols, because it, when it comes to guarding your heart, you ask the question, well, how do you do that? 1 John 5.21 says, um, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. And so we were looking at this whole thing of idolatry, um, and, and idols are really anything that we set on the throne of our hearts where Christ alone should be. Anything that becomes too important for us, more important in our lives than uh, Christ himself. And so last week we looked at the first two, um, why we have idols and how they affect us. And this week we're going to crack on and look at the last two, how to discern idols in my own heart, and in my own life, and how to disarm them. And if you remember last week, I gave you the homework, and I hope you did it, which was to look at uh, Psalm 139, verses 23 to 24, where David says to God, Search my heart, O God, and know me. See if there's any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. Or see if there's anything in me that you are not pleased with. See if there's any idolatry. And I hope you were able to do that. I spent some time doing that. Uh, as you know, when, when you preach a message, it first does its work in you before you deliver it. And so it's been, for me, a very productive time, and I hope you're able to do that. And I hope what we go through today will actually help you as you um, set yourself on guarding your heart. So how to discern idols? There's three things. And again, as I've said last week, I've uh, been leaning heavily on an article or a document by Tim Keller called Understanding Your Heart. So a lot of the material in this message um, comes from there. So how do we discern them? So three things we're going to look at, problem emotions, um, motivational desires, and diagnostic questions. So the first one is, is emotions. And I've said here that emotions are great idol detectors because they tell us in no uncertain terms whether or not the heart is getting what it wants and just how badly something is desired. So the things I say, I can deceive you with, and, uh, but, but the way I feel just never lies about whether my heart is getting what it wants or not. And we're going to see how certain emotions, as they are expressed through us, can give us an indication of the existence of idols in our hearts. And we're going to look at three of them, uh, just an example. So the first one is anger. Now, there are many reasons why uh, you could be angry or why you could get angry. But certainly one of the reasons that we get angry is that there is, there's something that I feel I really must have, which I'm being blocked from getting. So I want you to think about the last time you got really angry. Maybe you're really angry right now. And when you analyze that, I think what you'll find is the reason you got angry or the reason you are angry is because there's something that your heart desires, something that you really want that somebody or some situation is blocking you or preventing you from getting. And it's not that it, we, we, we don't have needs. In fact, we do have genuine and uh, God-given needs. But the issue is that when a need is elevated to that which the heart most desires, not just desires, and, and, and here's, here's the thing with idolatry. It's not just that your heart desires something as though desiring something were evil. It's not. It's when that desire, to use the phrase from last week, becomes inordinate, is blown up to religious proportions because it's taken the place that God only should have. So when that need is elevated to that which the heart not just desires but most desires, it becomes an idol and its denial triggers a disproportionate anger response. And it's not to say that every time you get angry, you know, there's an idol, but these are just things that you can use to flag as potential indicators. And, and how do I know 
if something has been elevated to something that my heart just, not just desires, but most desires, I've given us a quick test here. So just go back in your mind to that time when you got really angry um, and freeze frame before you react and ask yourself this question. What is more important to me in that moment? Is it getting the thing that I desire, whether it's a promotion at work or something from your spouse, whatever it is, what's more important to me, to my heart in this moment, to get what I want or to display God's glory through me, okay? Because if it's to get what I want and you are blocking me from getting what I want, the response is going to be ang anger, okay? Because that desire has become inordinate. It's, it's not just something that I want. It's something that's become something that I feel I really, really need. But if what's most important to me in that moment is God's glory through me, and I, I can stop in that moment and ask the question, hold on, um, before I react, let me ask myself a few questions. God, are you still my father? Do you still love me? Am I still created in your image? Are your promises still true? Do you still hold me in the palm of your hands? Are you still looking after me? Have you still got promises of hope in the future? If the answer is yes, and of course it is, then I feel it is well with my soul. And out of that place of wellness, peace, contentment with the thing that my heart most truly desires, I can now respond to this blocked goal. And how do I respond if my heart is fundamentally well? Well, it's not going to be in anger, is it? And so that's just a practical example of how when we set in our hearts Christ as Lord, how these things that would normally make us angry because they have not become inordinate desires, we can then respond calmly to. Another emotion is fear. And again, there's different reasons why we can fear. But certainly one of the reasons we get into fear is that there's something that I feel I really need, which I'm in danger of not getting. Okay? And so that could be uh, a relationship. It could be provision. There's one for now, for, for these days, isn't it? Where uh, there are many people who are listening to this who are uncertain as to whether they're going to get a salary next month, whether they'll have a job in three weeks' time. And you may say, well, you know, isn't that, isn't that reasonable then to fear if I don't know that I'm not going to have a salary? And I said, you know, the, when, when, when that, um, that thing has become an idol, if you're looking to it for your security, identity, worth, provision, etc. So again, it's not, just, it's not that um, we shouldn't desire provision, but it's that what, what can happen is when we elevate provision to that place where uh, God should be, then we are in danger of it becoming an idol. And I'll use provision because I think that's where many people are at right now. Um, so if you're thinking, well, I may not have a salary, and we elevate salary to the thing that our heart most wants, and we actually forget what Jesus says in, say, Matthew 6. He says, do not worry. Why? Not because you're always going to have a salary, but because God, your Father, knows what you already need. And so when God is in that place of elevation in our hearts where he should be, we are looking to him for provision. We're not looking to salary to make sure that we will be okay. And God provides sometimes through salary, but also in many different ways. And so that's an example of how if, if we're looking to say salary, as uh, if, if that becomes an idol in our lives, we can get into a place of fear. Here's another emotion, self-hatred. Self-hatred is quite subtle because um, people generally don't wake up and think, gosh, I hate myself. It's, it's kind of more, um, it's, it's, it's subliminal. And uh, for, for uh, quite often when you are in this place of self-hatred, it's not really something that's conscious, but there is somewhere a tape that's playing that's beaten, where you're beating yourself down because of one thing or another. And it may be that you have failed in something that you feel you should have been by now or something that you should have acquired by now or something that you should have accomplished by now. And again, it's not sinful to be ambitious. But when your heart is given over, remember we talked last week about how our hearts are 
are inbuilt for worship. Our hearts are inbuilt to give themselves to something. So when your heart is given over to that which you desire to obtain or achieve, you give that thing the power to define you and ultimately to destroy you. And uh, how does that work? Well, if, if my definition of success is by the time I reach 45, I should be living in this house, have this certain job, etc., etc. If I don't accomplish that, then I feel that I'm a failure. That has defined me. And yet when we read the scripture, uh, nowhere does God say that we are to be defined uh, by what we are. Uh, are in and of ourselves, what we have in terms of possessions, uh, or what we have accomplished. And so when, when, when uh, we set something up, a goal or an ambition, as, as an idol, as a thing that we absolutely must have, we give it the power to, to define us. So that problem emotions, but there's also um, our heart motivation or our motivational drives. And again, this is not to say that um, anytime you, you know, experience an emotion or uh, when, as we come to talk about drives that, oh, you, there's an idol. But these are just little flags that you can use to check your heart from time to time to say, hang on, when I see this, um, maybe let me dig a little bit further. Tim Keller says, as soon as our loyalty to anything leads us to disobey God, we are in danger of making it an idol. So a couple of examples. So here's, uh, here are two good things, working hard. So work is a good thing. We were created by God to work. So work is a really, really good thing. But when working hard gets in the way of caring for your family, which is something that God also ordained, and God has also told you to love and nurture and take care of your family. So when one God thing starts to infringe on another God thing, that is a flag that maybe work is taking a place of far too much importance in my life, that perhaps work is becoming an idol. And let's just run with that uh, because for some of you, maybe that's not the issue. Maybe you uh, are so committed to your family, so love, so nurture, so spend time with your family that you neglect to love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Well, whoever's next to anyone who's not your family. So there are some of us who could be in that place that we just love our family so much. Everything is about my family. Okay? All of the time I have is for my family. All of the money I get is for my family. And we are doing that to the exclusion of looking out for other people and people who don't have and people who are in need and so on. And so even something as good as Family can become an idol. How about being liked? Okay. Um, I don't think there's any way in the Bible that, you know, God says, you know, thou shalt go out and make sure that thou art liked. But at the same time, I think when we are displaying the fruit of the Spirit, we generally are likable people. And being likable is not a bad thing in and of itself. However, when being liked or likable gets in the way of speaking the truth, in love, then we are in danger of making that being liked or that how people perceive us, making that an idol in our lives. So that's just an example of what this looks like. And um, in this article, um, Keller gives us an example of certain, um, I guess, idolatries, motivational idolatries that can take root often without even realizing it. And often we don't realize it because a lot of the things that motivate our hearts are actually godly things, okay? And so there isn't often an, uh, uh, the sense of one is in sin, okay? But the subtlety, there's a subtlety there where that which is a good thing becomes an ultimate thing without us realizing it. And so I'm not going to preach through these. I'm just going to, and there's uh, quite a few of them, I'm just going to read them out, Okay, and uh, almost like holding up a mirror. And you can just look at that. And as I go through them, maybe something will ping in your own heart. And you just maybe think, yeah, I'm, I maybe must go back to that. So if you're in a place where you can, if you're being honest with yourself, you would say, life only has meaning, or I only have worth, or feel fulfilled, or feel happy, or 
feel at peace if, and then how you end this sentence. So if you empower idolatry, if I have power and influence over other people. If you're an approval idolatry, well, uh, life only has meaning if I'm loved and respected by such and such a person. Again, keep playing the tape. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't look for people's respect. It just means that must never become our motivational drive. That mustn't be the thing that gives life fulfillment, meaning, joy, peace. Okay, so keep playing that tape. A comfort, idolatry. I, life only has meaning or I'm only happy if I have a particular quality of life. Image, idolatry. I'm only happy or fulfilled or joyful if I have a particular kind of look or body image. Ladies, I'm not looking at you. Control, idolatry. I am able to get, if I'm, uh, if I'm able to get mastery over my life in the area of helping idolatry. How about that, right? Something as good and as noble as helping can become an idol in your life. If your life only has meaning, if you only feel a sense of self-worth when people are depending on you and you feel that people need you, okay? Uh, but you could flip that. So dependence, idolatry. Life only has meaning if, if there is someone to protect me and keep me safe, okay? Independence idolatry. Well, only if I'm completely free from obligations or responsibilities to take care of someone. And some of you young men, this might be something that's been lurking in your heart where um, you've struggled in relationships, you haven't known why. Maybe there's independence idolatry there. Maybe uh, the, this, this whole idea of, living your life free in the wind, going where you want, uh, has become the most important thing to you. And you haven't even realized that, okay? Um, work idolatry. Life only has meaning. I'm only fulfilled when I'm being highly productive, getting a lot done. Achievement idolatry. When I'm being recognized for my accomplishments or excelling in my career. Materialism idolatry. When I have a certain level of wealth or financial freedom. Religion idolatry? Really? Absolutely. And often it's some of the best things that God has given us that can become idols in our lives. So life only has meaning or only feel uh, fulfilled if I'm adhering to my religious moral codes and I'm accomplished in its activities. So if I'm, you know, head usher and I'm leading this and I'm on that committee and I'm, and I'm ticking all of those boxes. And then irreligion idolatry, okay? Opposite of that, I feel fulfilled or life has meaning if I am totally independent of organized religion and I'm living by self-made morality. Uh, and here's one, individual person idolatry. I think we all get into this at some point. So I only feel fulfilled. I only feel happy. I only feel at peace. If this particular person is happy and or is happy with me. And if they're not, then I'm down in the dumps. What about inner ring idolatry? Life only has meaning if a particular social group or professional group lets me in, if I'm part of the crowd, part of the team. Family idolatry. If my children and or my parents are happy with me. Relationship idolatry. I'm only happy and I can only be happy if Mr. Right or Miss Right is in love with me. Uh, I should say ideology. There's a little I hidden there. My political or social uh, cause or party is making progress and ascending to influencing power. So the final way that we can um, discern idols in our lives is really a combination of the two. And it, it's taking those two problem emotions and motivational drives and asking questions of myself. Okay? And I've put there... Um, in yellow, what, what I think uh, is driving that particular question, whether it's a problem, emotion, or motivational drive, uh, just to give you some indication. So if you ask yourself the question, what is my greatest nightmare? When I think about the absolute worst thing that could go wrong in my life, what is that thing? Okay, what is it that I worry most about? Again, it's not to say that there's idolatry there, it's to say there might be idolatry, or you may be in danger of making that thing into an idol. What if I fail or lost it would cause me to feel that I did not even want to live, okay? This is not theory. This is real life, okay? People who commit suicide get to that point 
where they feel like, because I do not have this thing, life is no longer worth living. And it's not people, just people who commit suicide. Uh, I, th there are times when we ourselves, many of us who, you know, who perhaps may never commit suicide, do actually have what we might call suicidal thoughts. It's not that you're seriously cont contemplating suicide, but you're just thinking, ugh, if life could end right now, I'd be okay with that. What keeps me going? What is it that drives me? What do I rely on or comfort myself with when things get bad or get difficult? Okay, so when, when uh, life hits rock bottom, where does my mind go to to find comfort? To say, well, you know what? Your whole world has collapsed, but at least what is that thing? Or what do I think most easily about? Where does, what does my mind go to when I'm free? This is a good one to think about is when you drift off to sleep, where does your mind go just before you nod off? When you wake up in the morning before the day begins, where does your mind go? It's not to say you're an idolatry, but it's just to say that that could be an indication that that thing is taking the place of prominence, ultimate prominence in your life. How about this one? What prayer unanswered would make me seriously think about turning away from God? What is that one thing that I say, God, if this thing that I've been praying and praying and praying and praying for doesn't come to pass, honestly, I don't think we can carry on. A few more. What makes me feel most self-worth? What am I most proud of? Could just be an indication there's an idol there. What do I really want and expect out of life? What would really make me happy? Okay, so there are some tools uh, that you can use as you just self-check from time to time to see what's really going on in your heart. So I'm going to move on to the last thing now. Uh, having discerned idols in our lives, what we actually do to disarm them. And in this uh, paper, Keller suggests two wrong or options, and one right one. And we'll go through those very quickly. The first option is the moralizing approach, which says, okay, I have recognized or discerned idols in my heart, um, and so my analysis is that I'm, I'm doing wrong. I'm doing the wrong thing, okay? Solution, just repent. Stop doing it, okay? Don't do that because it's wrong. But the problem with that moralizing approach is that it fails to answer some important questions. Why do I find I want to do these wrong things? So I could say, sorry to God today, wake up tomorrow, and still want to do that same thing. So it's not getting, it's not going deep enough. It's not going to the root of the issue. Okay, it's not answering the question, what are the inordinate desires, those desires that have become too big, that are drawing me to want to do those things? And what are the idols and false beliefs behind them? What are the things that I'm believing that this idol or this thing are going to give me? So that's the moralizing approach, and it doesn't go anywhere near the root of the problem. Then there's the psych, um, psychologizing approach, which focuses um, not so much on behavior, but on feelings or emotions. And in this approach, the analysis is that, well, uh, you obviously aren't really feeling God's love or knowing that God loves you as you are, and your solution is just to just see that God loves you. But again, the problem is, even when I wake up in the morning and read the Bible and I think, okay, I, I know God loves me, it's not dealing with the question of why do I still have these feelings of despair, of self-hatred, of anger, of lust, whatever it is, okay, when this particular thing happens. What are those inordinate desires that are being frustrated to trigger a response of those emotions? And again, what are the idols and false beliefs behind them? And finally, of course, the right answer is the gospel approach. So when I've discerned idols in my heart and I've recognized behavior, that's not right. And I'm asking the question, what's the problem really? It's not just that I'm doing wrong. It's not just that I'm having inordinate desires. What is the real issue? And the gospel answer to that, the real issue, my friend, is that you are looking to something other than Christ for your 
happiness. And when we double-click happiness, security for my self-worth, for my significance, for my peace, for my joy, all of these things which ultimately my heart can only truly find in Christ, I am looking not to the Creator, but to a created thing. And the solution, therefore, is to recognize that as sin and repent and say, God, I've, I, I recognize that I have sinned by, as Paul says in Romans 1, pledging allegiance to created things, not to the Creator. And then find joy in your salvation. And when I click salvation, uh, a whole lot of things come out of that. Peace, peace with God, peace with others. My value is in Him. My worth is in Him. My provision is from Him. My security is in Him. My joy is in Him. My comfort comes from Him. My hope ultimately is in Him. And this approach answers all of the real questions. The issue of behavior, the things I'm doing, the desires that are driving me to do those things, the false beliefs that are making me think that it's okay to have those desires and believe in that way, and the idol at the root of it all that is creating that what we call delusional field of false beliefs that is creating inordinate desires and ultimately those behaviors that I would like to stop because I'm a Christian, but I can't because I haven't stopped having the desires to do those things. And I'm still having those desires to do those things because I have in my head, in my heart, a delusional field of false beliefs that has rewritten what's acceptable and what's not. And behind all that, that idol. And once we uproot, and this is where the gospel approach is the only one, because it gets right to the root of the issue. So how do I repent? Three things I want to uh, just put out there. The first is to, is to name the idols. It's, uh, it's one thing to say, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry for what? Um, and it's not just about, it's, when we repent, we need to understand the mechanism of sin. We need to understand what is it that's actually been going on. It's not just saying, oh, sorry, God. It's understanding the mechanism, the uh, infrastructure of sin that has been built up in my life so I can dismantle it. So, and how do I name them? Well, I can ask God, like I asked you to do last week. I can ask the people who uh, are closest to me. How about that? How about asking the people who know you best? Just say to them, uh, please would you just think about and let me know, when we're together, what is it I speak about most? Right? What, 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 do, I, what do I generally talk about most? That will give you a good indication. Again, not necessarily of idolatry, but of an area and areas in your life where you may be in danger of idolatry. And also use the tools. Self-diagnose as you go. When you get angry, think, okay, what's happening here? What am I pursuing? What is, it that the, what is the thing that I really want? Has it become too big in my life? So name the idols. Write them down, okay? As you, as you pray, actually write down. Here it is. Bang, bang, bang. Then identify and renounce false beliefs. And this is very important. And I think where, where this is important is that I think often we think about repentance as saying, Lord, I'm sorry. Uh, repentance goes a lot deeper than that. Because Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 10 and 5 uh, that we are to demolish arguments and false pretensions. This is part of repentance. is not just saying sorry to God, but is about dismantling the architecture of sin that has taken hold of our lives. It's about recognizing this is how sin, this sin system has been constructed in my life and systematically dismantling it. And we can't dismantle it until we've actually thought through. I was angry. And what, what did, because, because uh, in, in, in my heart, the thing I wanted most, more than anybody else, more than anything else, is to have 
um, this position at work. And that had become an idol in my life. What false beliefs did that create? It created the false beliefs that it didn't matter what I had to do to get to the top. It created the false belief that it was okay to neglect my family and my kids or my other relationships to get to that point. It created the belief that it didn't matter how tired I got or whatever God said about rest, I could not rest. until. And you write all of those things down as you begin to work out the architecture of sin and you recognize those things as lies and you go to the Word and say, okay, this is the sin system. This is the architecture of sin of the things that I have believed. What does God say about those things? And we begin to systematically say, ah, this is wrong. I renounce that belief. I renounce that faulty thinking. I replace it with the truth of God's word. Repentance is not just saying, sorry, God, see you in two days time when I'm back in this place. It's, a, it's an intentional dismantling of the architecture of sin in your heart. So identify and renounce false beliefs. Number three, displace the idol with Christ. Paul says in Colossians 3 verse 1, uh, set, set your hearts on, on things above. And I think it's First Peter, where he, he uh, perhaps chapter 3, it says, in, in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Because idolatry is setting apart something else, a created thing as Lord, a functional Savior, the thing that will give me ultimate joy, fulfillment, happiness, or whatever the thing is. And, and how do we do that? How do we set apart Christ as Lord? Go back to day one of Sunday school. Read your Bible. Pray every day. Fill your heart with the knowledge of Him. Fill your heart with the truth. Meditate upon the truth. There's a book by Thomas Chalmers, and I think it's so helpful in this, in this instance. Once we understand that our hearts have this inbuilt worship mechanism, he says that the only way to dispossess the heart of an old affection is by the expulsive power of a new one. And what he's saying there in this instance is, our heart will not let go of idolatry of created things until those desires are displaced by a greater affection for the Creator. And those of you who've been around babies will understand this. If you've ever tried to take or to dispossess a baby, who, especially those who are about teething age, and they've got a hold of a set of keys. Have you ever tried to take those keys away from the baby? You'll know that there simply is no other way to do that except by displacing those keys with something else. And not just anything else, because for some reason they have an antenna for stuff that's fake and they're not interested. If they're holding real keys and you jangle plastic keys, it's not going to happen. They want something that they somehow know is of value to you. Something that's real, your iPhone. Something that their slobber can destroy properly. And only as you give them that expensive, beloved iPhone, only as they see and their hearts are drawn to a greater affection. Will they relinquish your slobbered up keys? Because their heart has grabbed hold of something that is of greater value. And Thomas Chalmers is saying, that's the way the heart works. You don't let go of old affections simply because the preacher told you that those are bad. We let go of old affections because our hearts have been turned to a new and greater 
and more worthy affection. And he goes on to say, and I'll end with this. It says, we know of no other way by which to keep the love of the world out of our heart than to keep it, than to keep in our hearts the love of God. And no other way by which to keep our hearts in the love of God than building ourselves up on our most holy faith. So before I hand over to Bruce, I just want to pray for us. And Father, I want to thank you for your word. And, and by the way, just even as I, I started to pray, I was, I was just reminded of something that came to me as I was processing this for myself this week, is that this isn't just about being a good Christian or doing the right thing. It's, it's liberation for you and for me. Idols cannot give you the things that they promise to give you. They don't satisfy, ultimately. And so when we obey God by guarding our hearts and, and keeping them away from idols, it brings freedom and joy. That's what God wants for us. He doesn't want us to live by rules. Don't touch, don't do, da 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 He wants freedom for us. He wants liberation from us. He wants true joy. And the reason he, he says to us, fix your hearts on me, is because he knows that's where our hearts will truly find all that it seeks. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this. Thank you for your word. And I want to pray for uh, myself and pray for everyone who's listening here. I pray that you would help us in these days to um, take to heart this word that you have given to us, to mix it with faith. Lord, that it will bear fruit for your glory. I pray for freedom even now, for chains to fall off, false beliefs to start getting dismantled. I pray for the conviction of heart to see this word through. That's, it wouldn't end when the video stops but that we would take this and with the help of your Holy Spirit, dismantle sin's architecture in our hearts so that we would be able to uh, not only experience freedom and joy in you, but be able to glorify you in all that we say and do because that's what we were created to do. We ask this in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Brister.